potential in terms of its efficiency and its cost reduction, mostly its efficiency, and so that's a problem. But in some ways, it's still the perfect thin film because, after all, it is silicon. It'll never have an availability issue. It'll never have a toxicity issue. And so that's why, with the reasonable efficiencies and some hope for going down that learning curve, there's still a lot of emphasis in amorphous silicon and microcrystalline silicon thin films. Cadmium telluride is kind of the compromise as far as efficiency. It's the in-between in between efficiencies, but still rather higher than amorphous silicon and probably good enough, in fact, quite good enough to be successful as a thin film. 11% modules have been made, but more typical modules are 8% to 10%. It's the fastest and the cheapest way to deposit it. Uh, there's a technology, a company called First Solar, that, take, that takes under one minute to deposit the active layers. It's becoming better established in the field, but in terms of reliability, but there's a window of uh, deposition that has to be absorb, observed to make successful materials. And so that puts some stress on the manufacturing yield because it means the yield has to be maximized for both efficiency and also for uh, the window of reliability. But the comments are more important than cad telluride because in a way, cad telluride is the perfect thin film. It's the thin film that probably would dominate photovoltaics going forward were it not for these two comments. The one comment is that it has a small amount of cadmium. And that is the most important thing. Several Fortune 500 companies have done work in this material and then dropped out because of cadmium. They're afraid of the perception of cadmium. It is not an environment, safety, and health issue. Hundreds of publications can be referenced on that to suggest that it doesn't hurt you in manufacturing, it doesn't hurt you in use, it doesn't hurt you in disposal or recycling. It even passes the EPA toxicity test for disposal which current crystalline silicon modules don't pass for lead solder. But the perception of cadmium is overwhelming, and nobody wants to have the next safe asbestos product if they have deep, product, deep pockets in the current highly uh, uh, legalistic framework that we live in. So you can add this to one of your, sub, your subject issues. Do we have too many lost technologies because of perception of uh, legal downsides. There's another problem which is actually real. That's tellurium availability. There's about 2,000 metric tons of tellurium not used in the world. If you took per year, if it took uh, three grams of tellurium per uh, square meter, it would take about thir three metric tons per gigawatt. That would be about 70 gigawatts per year of uh, CAD telluride modules, an adequate start. That's already tellurium sitting in copper slag heaps because there's no use for it. So that's without any stress on the am amount of tellurium available. And coppernium diselenide is kind of thought of as the, the dark horse. It's where all of the companies that aren't doing CAD telluride are going. <laughs> it's the high efficiency technology that works. It's a little harder to make and it's a little further behind in terms of manufacturing, but really it has all the characteristics of a terrific thin film that should meet the cost goals. It's very important to us that Shell Solar maintain its, its commitment and that there are new companies, approximately 25 new companies starting in the United States and around the world in copperinium diselenide. So that's a very important fact for the future. Uh, there's a long list here of uh, research. How am I doing on time? Okay, there's a long list here of research that we aren't doing because of that $80 million solar budget. If you go to the bottom, you'll see why they matter. They would re greatly reduce the risk of the transition to large-scale manufacturing and early deployment. The risk in large-scale manufacturing of new technology is that you're in exp exponential growth in very complex technologies. And I want to di diverge for a moment, moment here and say that our program has been pretty successful in going to high efficiency and pretty successful in making in supporting companies to make one of a kind 13% modules. But we've done this the way a kid crosses a stream on slippery rocks. We've run across this stream once to show we can do it and we've made a big cheer for ourselves when we got to the other side. But we're not telling you about the number of times we cracked our heads on the rocks. But we're not telling you about the number of times that new companies tried to do this and cracked their heads on the rocks. 
Uh, BP Solar was in thin films before, and they had some problems transitioning to successful manufacturing, and they dropped out. They're just one of probably about 10 companies that have tried to develop these technologies where the money meets the road in terms of very high cost of the transition to manufacturing and crack their heads. So we've done this on a one-of-a-kind basis to show it can be done. We've done it because we thought it would be useful to the world to know that the proof of concept exists, that it can be done. It's nice to sit here in a room and say, these thin films do make sense. If we'd, if we'd taken the conservative approach, we'd still be on the edge of the bank looking at that first slippery rock, trying to do everything right. We didn't take that approach. But based on the approach we took, you have no certainty in the marketplace, in private industry, that you will succeed if you try to take one of these thin films to large manufacturing. So that's one of the things that we would do with more money. We'd try to reduce those risks. The second thing that we could do with more money is we take a large fraction out of the cost of the semiconductor, both in terms of the transparent part, which is the, the amount of material, but the less obvious part, which is the deposition time, which translates to the capital cost and the energy cost and the facility cost, all the other costs. In a way, that's what you're seeing in the third generation thin films. You're seeing third generation thin films starting from low cost, trying to get to high efficiency. What we are starting from is high efficiency, trying to get to lower cost. And that would be done with this other research funding. But let's look at the real world again for a minute. We just sustained a 20% cut in th the thin film budget just because the small fluctuations in the very small budgets that we have affect us every day and every year of our uh, struggle and why some of the people in the room sound like they're coming from that small mind when they try to address this very large topic of energy significance. Because in the real world, our budget in thin films just went down 20%, and we dropped a CIS Inc. nanoparticle approach that was within a month picked up by the Malaysian government at $100 million a year because they think it's the most promising new technology in the world. Well, each of these investors thinks their choice is the most uh, promising. We happen to think this one is a very promising one. We also dropped a multi-junction amorphous silicon on microcrystalline, nanocrystalline silicon technology that was being done in a very large-scale batch reactor where the cost could be low. These are the, what we consider to be our fringe uh, components of our program. These are the ones we dropped. So we also dropped 40 percent of the fundamental research to help us get across those slippery stones because we can't afford that. We're still trying to do the, the hit those home runs and run across those rocks and show people that the potential is there. So despite the 40 new companies that have come in in copper and disilonide, amorphous silicon and cad telluride, we didn't pick up a single one of them. We dropped them instead. So this is the real world and it should be borne in mind in terms of the fantastic background of giga dollars that we're talking about here. We, our program rounds down to zero when you're talking giga dollars. I made a long list of the pessimist and optimist research topics that we would, we would approach, and these are uh, pretty much every fear that I could imagine and have lived with for 20 years and every hope that I've also imagined on the right side. Uh, I'm not going to go through this list. Uh, if it comes up that we need this kind of list, we can use it. It's in the, re it's in the record. But uh, a summary of this list is really here. And it's basically the same thing I just said. We're trying to change the world's energy infrastructure. We're doing it on a shoestring. We've done proof of concept. But <clears throat> the inherent technical risks of these technologies, I mean, essentially, we're trying to get to under $50 a square meter for semiconductor technologies. That's about the cost of a quality carpet. So you know, if you could get $50 a square meter of flat panel displays, you'd be very happy. So let's bear in mind what kind of challenges we have here. Remember, we're trying to do the cost and the efficiency, and anything that is too skewed to one side or the other will miss the boat. So the path forward for PV is actually pretty straightforward. What's really gotten PV going is the subsidies in Europe and Japan. Without those subsidies, we probably wouldn't be here because we wouldn't have enough PV in the world for you to notice it. 
The other part of that uh, is the success of some technology development and R&D programs such as the DOE program, which has at least given us some choices so that if we want to go forward with energy significance, we have a chance to do that. So we need to have the continuation, even growth, of those subsidies and those R&D programs. We also need to realize that this is a global commons problem. If we were just buying electricity, we wouldn't do solar energy. We know where the plug is. We, we know what the next step is if we have to worry it's coal or nuclear energy. We wouldn't be suing solar energy. We have to realize that solar energy is not motivated purely by the marketplace. It has to be motivated by conscientious leadership in the global commons, which means governments, non-government organizations, scientific uh, representatives, people who lead the awareness of other people. That's the way we can get there from here. We already have the model with wind generation that subsidies and, uh, and research can actually get you to low cost. So we need to use those smarts to bring, uh, bring about change here. And obviously, we need the PV R&D. We don't want to be rounded down to zero in this kind of a problem. And we need the infrastructure R&D. If we're going to attack this big problem, we need storage. We need long distance transmission. The dream of hemispheric transmission, north, south, and east, west, is a beautiful dream for technologies that are limited by seasonal fluctuations and day-night day fluctuations and, and uh, cloudy skies. Those are wonderful additions to add and uh, are almost as important in a way as the generation technology itself. We need more money. We need consistency. Some other real problems in the PV funding world is it's hard to get people and the normal people proactive about PV. The general feeling about PV is still what is a PV. So we'd like to hope that that's going to change now that PV is in the real world. PV is also not mainstream science. There's not a school of PV. PV is a stepsister science. Regular scientists don't publish in PV uh, journals. We need the participation of the real scientific community. It's an important area, and we need the scientists who are leaders in the world of science to get out there and make a stand in the PV uh, science area. PV needs the subsidies, but Americans don't like to subsidize anything, despite the fact that, as Professor Hoffert recently pointed out, many new developments on a large scale in the world of the 21st century started with government support, including nuclear energy and the DARPA work and the Internet. <clears throat> And I'd like to finish with what I call the leaky roof syndrome. When it rains, we want to fix the roof, but nobody wants, wants to go out on a roof when it's slippery. When it stops, rains, stops raining, the roof stops leaking. You soon forget about it, especially when you think about all the contractors you have to hire to fix the roof. Very easy to forget. Then, next time it rains, it leaks again. What the hell happened to that photovoltaics? Why isn't it ready by now? I can't spend more money on photovoltaics. I've already spent 20 years of money on photovoltaics. Why should I spend new money on it now? The emergency goes away, you stop worrying about it anyway. So we're back to where we start. So let's start having a commitment this time that the roof is leaking. The roof is leaking, right? We're all conscientious. But suppose it goes back again to $20 a barrel. We won't be so conscientious. Let's spend the money and let's have a commitment. Thanks very much. Okay, we have time for a discussion of maybe 20 minutes, and I'm sure there must be a question or two uh, uh, for Ken and uh, uh, any one of the other morning speakers. And Shirley, start us out. Hello, my name is Shirley Neff, and I actually came to Rice to participate in a surrogate debate on energy policy yesterday. I came on behalf of the Kerry campaign. Um, actually, though, I spent a number of years as the economist for the Senate Energy Committee in Washington, and I'm doing some work with NREL now on commercialization and market issues related to um, increasing penetration of um, solar PV in the U.S. market. And I think I was given a spot at the table so that I would give you this message. So if you'll <laughs> bear with me for a few minutes, I'll respond to what I think was Ken's 
sort of direction at me with respect to small-minded thinking and PV. I mean, Not me, but you. more generally Washington. It's, it's our problem, all of us. Um, and I'm going to tell you some anecdotes about things that have actually happened. A few years ago, Admiral Truly, the director of the National Renewable Energy Lab, came in to meet with Senator Jeff Bingaman from New Mexico and Wayne Allard from Colorado. They're the two co-chairs of the Renewable and Efficiency Caucus. And I think this must have been in about 99 where we'd had some really ugly fights in the Congress over funding for renewable energy. Anyway, Admiral Truly came in, made the case for NREL's budget, for greater support, and Senator Allard, in all honesty, just looked at him and said, you know, you come and tell me that, but no one else does. And I know a lot of you that are at universities, you're stuck with this little government relations office and the hierarchy in the administration of the university that decides who gets to talk to Congress. But I have to tell you, if the message does not get there, to more and more people in the Congress who really do control the funding. And what's happened is, I mean, the administration, on the one hand, they have to put forward a budget that's adequate. And in the budget environment that we're in, it's going to be increasingly difficult. We're kind of back to where we were a decade ago with, you know, very large budget deficits. So it's not going to be easy to get it through OMB. The other thing is the problem with earmarks. And unfortunately, there are a lot of folks who go, universities, and in fact, universities are notorious for this, actually, going to their delegations and getting specific earmarks for projects out of funding. And as you can talk to all these folks here from NREL who have seen their budgets eroded because of specific earmarks. But first and foremost, I wanted to say that you have to, you have to start speaking up and you have to talk to people who have the ability to influence the funding process. The other thing, and I said this to the solar industry for the last several years, you have to find champions. The wind industry has plenty of champions for R&D. The nuclear industry has plenty of champions. The chairman of the Energy and Water Subcommittee in the Senate, Pete Domenici, is a huge nuclear champion. He didn't get that way just out of, you know, the clear blue sky. And there is no one like that on solar. There's no one in the Congress, and in fact, um, I think it was a week, week and a half ago. The Congress took up this jobs tax bill that you've all heard about. It was, I don't remember the total, $150 billion of funding tax. Are, well, some of it was on, you know, to address the WTO um, subsidy issue, but it led to all sorts of additional tax measures. Um, there is an incentive there for manufacturing that will help PV. But on the energy section, and there was a big fight between the House and Senate over whether to include energy tax credits in it. Senator Grassley from the Ways and Means, or the Finance Committee, pushed very hard to include some energy provisions. There's an extension of something called Section 45 that's the production credit for wind that's been very um, important in developing wind energy in the United States. That was expanded to include biomass, geothermal, landfill gas, municipal solid waste, and solar. But it's not a very big incentive for you know, solar, and we're talking here concentrating solar, because you can't use that with the existing 10 percent credit. So basically there's nothing in that tax bill for solar energy. And one of the problems here is there was not a single member of Congress out of 535 members that offered or went to Finance or Ways and Means and asked them to put in the PV incentive or any kind of PV incentive. So solar lost, a $150 billion bill, and there's nothing there for solar. Okay, that's my spiel on the Congress. Um, one of the big issues, though, for PV, and somebody made the comment earlier that PV competes against base load. It doesn't. It competes against peaking generation, transmission, and in some areas, distribution. And one of the problems the industry's had is really making that case in the regulatory arena. The California Public Utility Commission right now is taking another look in much more depth at the costs and benefits of um, different distributed generation technologies. But PV really has to distinguish itself, even from the other renewable technologies. And I know most of you here are not economists and you don't deal in that realm, but this is a critical issue. I mean, the industry has done a great job, or, the, or I don't want to say just the industry, but the profession, at really focusing on the technology, but it's not made the business case in an effective way. Um, the programs in Japan, the Japanese model is phenomenal. That's something that we should be able to replicate in the United States. There are issues with respect to the German um, approach on a feed-in tariff that we just won't do here again because it's too much like the experience with PERPA. 
but um, I would just say that the, this whole issue of making the business case in the near term, and, and, and Ken's comment about, you know, we've been spending the money on this for 20 years and we haven't seen anything. I can't tell you how many times I've heard that from the appropriators. You know, Senator Reed from Nevada, Senator, New Mex or Senator Domenici from New Mexico, the two key people on energy and water that fund the, the NREL budget are from Nevada and New Mexico, and yet neither one of them are solar champions. So I just, you know, go back to that and the fact that you really do need to work with, you know, Amy's folks in this part of, of RICE where you're focusing on the policy and economic issues because we've got to get a much better message out about the solar's place in the market today, especially in areas where we're transmission constrained. So, anyway. Great. Comment? You know, I, I'd like to expand on, on this uh, perceptional gap, I think, which is enormous, between the way scientists and engineers who are actively working on, on alternative energies see the problem and the way it's perceived in, uh, politically. Uh, and, and this gets reflected in the way that the funding is distributed. Look, we have a Department of Energy. I, I don't know the exact number, but I think their budget is something like $20 billion a year. And, and NASA, which is a comparably sized agency, very recently went through a major transformation, whether they'll be successful or not, from what their mission was, which was to uh, essentially keep sending astronauts to the space station with an indeterminate mission, to some other mission. I, I don't want to argue whether that's good or bad, but the fact is there was, a, there is a reprogramming going on right now within an agency comparable to the Department of Energy. And, and I don't think that it's unreasonable for the scientific and engineering community to take as a goal the transformation of the Department of Energy. It's very hard to make even small changes in that uh, agency's budget. I don't want to take too much time up, but I just have to say something because I had a very interesting experience recently where I visited the Forest Law Building and there is a, a climate change technology program that actually exists that the administration has. Um, and within that climate change technology program, I, I and several colleagues had been trying to promote an exploratory research program similar to what NASA has that would look at what technologies ought to be developed over the next decades that could really make a transformational difference. Uh, and uh, without mentioning names, there were people in, in, in DOE who were actually somewhat intelligent. Uh, and, and that was put into the budget. Um, and it got shot down by the House. Uh, and I was asked the following. Look, you don't work for DOE lab, you're in a university. This is very similar to what you were saying. Why don't you talk to somebody about it? So I didn't even know who to talk to. I started wandering around the Dirksen office building, and I finally found out about the Menachis committee, and I actually won't, again, I won't mention names, but I found somebody, a clerk, I think is the official name for this person, who marks up these appropriation bills. And I, and, and I just walked in and I, I said, look, I'm not a lobbyist, I'm a college professor, but there's something very important that I want to talk to you about. And he said, okay, uh, you can't come into my office, I'll talk to you here. And he gave me 15 minutes. And I said, look, we have in the military, in the military R&D, we have DARPA, and they fund projects that are an awful lot crazier than anything we're talking about. I know I used to do military R&D. There are, the black space program is bigger than the white space program. And there are billions of dollars that are spent by organizations like the, the National Reconnaissance Office and so forth on, on very, very expensive research, and a lot of it doesn't work. But some of it does work, and the, and the, and the ones that do work ha have actually changed the world. Why can't our Department of Energy do the same thing? And why can't we even start this with a little dinky three or five million dollar a year program. Why can't this pass? And he said the same thing you said. He said nobody ever came and said that to me. So I'm thinking maybe we should start saying these things <laughs> as engineers and scientists who are working on this. We don't really know how to say these things. They don't teach us this in graduate school. Um, but, but, but I think that it is very, very important and perhaps we can have more discussions about this later. Stop now. Um, let's go to Alex first here. Marty, let me, let me, let me comment on your yeah. comment. And the answer is, actually we do, we do know how to say these things because we teach every day. Yeah. 
as university professors. The challenge is that we don't have the opportunity always to say them to the right people and make the point. And, 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 and I follow on. I have to go to my administration and beg and plead to go and be able to speak about some, some topic area as a university professor versus a, 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 a Joe Citizen guy. All right, so it's a real challenge there. Uh, Nate Lewis, so I have some personal as a university professor experience with this. Um, having been to my congressman on behalf of the American Chemical Society talking about energy and will presumably um, working for DOE on a report for solar that will hopefully affect the next budget cycle to be talked with in Congress. When I go to my university lobby office and uh, say we have a big problem with energy, um, let's try to raise visibility, they look right down the numbers list and say, but most of the federal research that comes into our university right now is from the NIH and in our priority list of where it's going to matter, why are we bothering to go looking at the nickel and dime numbers and getting a 10% increase or 50% increase in that when we're really worried about the billions of dollars that we might lose or gain in NIH? And so when setting priorities, um, the small numbers get small in the list because they're not the ones that people care about. And this is actually the same thing in the DOE. If you ask the DOE lobbyists uh, to worry about the solar budget, they're worried about the big projects and the, the equipment projects and the synchrotrons and the infrastructure that supports science and losing billions there as opposed to whether or not 70 million rounds to zero. So why bother? I don't know a good way of getting out of that syndrome of Having no money means that no one cares about it in the priority list, even if you try to push for it. So this is a very hard problem to deal with. A uh, fellow from NASA here, right? Do you want to come to a microphone? We were supposed to have some pass-around mics. Do we have any of those? No, I want you to have them come up to the podium. Or come up to the podium, or there's a seat right there and a the mic. And speak as much into the mic as you can. There, you know, Keep them pointed toward you. But you don't have to touch it. it it's working. Just have a seat and talk. Dr. Adams, thank you. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, um, enjoying every minute of this. I am here to learn. I am from NASA, and my name is Kumar Krishnan. I, I had two questions. One is basically on physics, and I'd like to get some ideas from you. I felt like the um, conversion of light into electricity uh, there are a couple of things. One is the polarization of the solar um, light, and the other is the scattering. Uh, sometimes, you know, you have perennial reflection, then you have the scattering problem. And I was wondering, we talk about increasing the efficiency, basically, uh, is one of the keys. Uh, how much does the polarization, uh, the ability that we're not <coughs> able to capitalize on um, getting the Pol unpolarized light to exactly give us better efficiencies, and how much does the scattering contribute to these inefficiencies? That was my first question. Then I'll follow on with the second question. Uh, is your second question more in line with the discussion that we're? Yes, the second about? question Why don't you is. Go ahead with that general. one, and we may defer your first question to uh, one of the later sessions. Okay. The second question days, is. Uh, NASA and uh, our other colleagues from DOE looked at solar power satellites long time back, as you may recall clearly. And I thought by this time, again, I'm on learning curve here. Um, I'm not in the field, but I touch a whole lot of technologies in NASA. And I thought by this time we would have a whole bunch of problems solved such that we can get efficiently this uh, solar power from satellites, first of all, I think the launching capabilities have uh, gone excellent, you know, now. <laughs> and then with the GPS concepts and, and having vibration, solar vibration points captured, I thought this would be a viable thing to discuss. I think we might get into that. I know. Uh, you know, we have some, uh, uh, I know Marty is very interested in solar powered satellites. There has been some progress. <clears throat> that would feed back to solar-powered satellites. Uh, some of the thin films can be very lightweight, yeah. can be put on uh, plastics, polyamide, 
and, uh, and have still a high power to weight ratio because of their reasonable efficiencies. Some, like copperium diselenide and cadmium telluride and morphosilicon, are very good in space in terms of radiation resistance. So there is some progress there that wasn't in existence the last time you looked. There are also some very high efficiency, 3-5 multi-junctions up to 40 percent efficiency. Those are generally used on Earth for uh, concentrators. If the uh, economic argument could be used in space for very high efficiency, they might also play. I don't know if Marty wants to say something about space drive. Before, Marty, can I just interrupt a second? Uh, Larry Kasmer. <coughs> Those, those, uh, those very high efficiency <coughs> solar cells, in fact, are, are the one, one uh, demonstration of a technology that has replaced silicon <coughs> in an application because every satellite that goes out and out from the United States, all the communication satellites, use triple junction gallium arsenide based devices because they are the most cost effective way for space above anything else. There's just a report that came out of NASA about uh, a year ago that shows that solar power for, for those applications. And that certainly was a technology that was initially developed under the uh, DOE terrestrial program that was transferred to space. So. Marty? Yeah, I, I've been talking a lot. Let me just quickly say something about this. I mean, there is John Mankins is the point person at NASA headquarters on, on this. Uh, <coughs> NASA has never actively followed up on earlier recommendations by the National Academy of Sciences to relook at solar power satellites. But there is a there is a small and dedicated community, and there are very good <coughs> arguments. Uh, one of the things that Ken was bringing up, thin films, but inflatable, rigidizable structures, so-called gossamer structures, together with thin films, <coughs> can produce high enough values of kilowatts per kilogram. And projected increases in launch costs together, those two factors uh, could be very important because when you get into geostationary orbit, you're getting something like seven times on average the solar flux per unit area at the Earth's surface. <clears throat> so the enabling technology is, first of all, low-cost launch, lightweight, thin film solar panels and inflatable structures, and uh, wireless power transmission, either by microwave or by laser. Um, and in my opinion, and opinion of people who work in, that, in this field, <clears throat> it's probably as feasible or more feasible to provide baseload power with that technology than to provide it with fusion. Now, fusion is still funded at several hundred million dollars a year, and we've certainly spent billions of dollars on fusion, but we've spent peanuts on solar power satellites. Uh, Amy, let's go for a comment. I, I want to make a comment going back to uh, Shirley Neff's point on uh, <coughs> going to Congress and the problem that you've all mentioned where the universities have their own agenda. Um, Rice has a peculiar thing. Uh, in that the first study we did on energy here at the Institute was on the Middle East, and I was a reporter who wrote a lot about oil in the Middle East, and they were looking for someone to craft a document for them, and so they hired someone who wasn't an academic. I'm not an academic. Those of you who know me know I'm not. Um, and it set up a very peculiar thing, because you had this human being on the campus who is a writer and an articulator who is not a professor. Right? And um, we wound up in a weird paradigm because I go in the press and I'm a talking head and so forth. And I want to tell you guys a story, and it's a true story and it hasn't turned into a policy yet, but I think it's a paradigm for the message that we all have here that we want to promote. When I, we did a task force on energy policy, Shirley was one of our task force members. Um, and, uh, and one of the things that one of our big recommendations at that time, which was in 1999-2000, was that um, if you just close this SUV loophole in Congress where light trucks get to count as a working vehicle and not as a car, even though everybody's driving them as a car, that you could save 925,000 barrels a day of oil imports over the number of years it would take you to change the fleet around. And we have an economist here at Rice who works with Dr. Hartley, a guy named Ken Metlock, who's a fellow at the Baker Institute, and he did the math. He worked around with all the numbers and came up with that number. And, um, and so I gave that number out to the press. And I got calls really, truly, 
from every major newspaper, San Francisco Chronicle, Orlando Sentinel, Chicago Tribune, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, pretty much every major newspaper in the country cited that figure, right? The figure, I'm sure, Shirley can confirm, was used on the Hill, so on and so forth. The statute was not passed. In other words, it was an obvious thing for the Congress to do. We never passed an energy bill. It never happened. But if you went out today and polled the average American, the average American understands the SUV classification is a problem. They understand that the SUVs are a problem. And it's just a question of going from the translation of what's in the total public good versus what is in the public good for voting people in Detroit. Right? And, and I think that we're much closer to getting there now. I mean, of course, it's been four years, so maybe not. But the point is, the first step was the public had to understand the issue. I would say, I don't know if Shirley would agree with me, I believe the public does understand this issue now. And if we could put it as a ballot thing on, the, on a referendum, in other words, we could take it away from the Congress, and we just have Americans vote like the way Houstonians voted, whether they wanted the Olympics or not, right? It's just an item on the ballot that you could get 75% of Americans to vote to close that loophole, even though they're driving one of those cars, right? So, because they understand the issue. People do not understand the issue for solar and the impact that we have in terms of people are starting to understand global warming, but the bottom line is they flick on their switch in their house and they don't really, really, really understand that there's a fuel behind that electricity, right? It is imperative, and I'm going to start this process by sending the media to all of you when they call me, right, that everybody here and those that you know who aren't here start to try to get themselves into the media on this topic. The media is focused on this topic. National Geographic had an article, a big front page article. We got all these books coming out. You get people on the talk show circuits. It is possible to get people to listen to this topic at this 10 seconds, as Ken mentioned, because the roof is leaking, right? And the first step to being able to go to the Hill and have someone actually take the meeting and not take the meeting for 15 minutes as a courtesy, but to actually want to hear what you have to say is to have the public understand the issue. And it sounds, it's a very slow process because it's so time consuming and people are so misinformed, but it really is the first step because in the end, everybody who's in Congress has someone vote for them. I, I went with 25 people, senators and congressmen to Russia last year with the Aspen Institute and they rotated me around to have dinner with three of them at a time over the course of a week and a half. And I was shocked at how well informed they were. In other words, from looking out the outside and seeing the policies that get passed, I just thought they didn't know anything about anything in this subject, <laughs> right? But, but the truth was they were incredibly well informed. I mean, people really knew the nitty, nitty, nitty gritty details, but they're not voting that way because their constituents don't know those details. So I would say, you know, step number one, step number one is public information, right? And that could be with your students, it can go beyond the university, right? Um, that really is the first step. And then step two is, as Shirley said, is to, is to try to figure out after we've done step one, uh, which really doesn't have to take that long because the public, it takes longer when the public's not interested, but it happens that the public's interested right now you know, step number two is, as Shirley said, is to find people who are in a sunny state that could get a subsidy, that could have an industry that moves forward, right, to be interested in this. Okay, I think that's a great uh, point to uh, stop for our break. If we don't take a break now, we'll be running uh, into the next speaker. And I'll, I'll simply uh, tell you something that Dashwan Feng, who's the uh, Vice President of Research at UT Dallas, said, um, Vision without funding is hallucination. <laughs> so uh, let's take a break and start at, uh, uh, let's say, 5 after 11 now. Yes, why don't you give it to the guys and... Uh, it's a quick time movie. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure they can. Yeah. I mean, you got to be able to quick time standards. So.
And, or uh, you could just plug in the Mac. It doesn't matter. All right, we'll see. Uh, people want to see. Can we? Uh, he's got a disc uh, that's got a quick time movie. Yeah. I also have a Mac that just set up the play. Did you just well, I mean, at way. this point, I mean, I'm the clear we have we, enough No, we don't time. need it during the talk, but you if don't need you loaded it, it sometime so that during the hour discussion we have before lunch, uh, he might uh, show us this interview on or the Or at least time. part of it. Is so you have, have quick time? Mm -hmm. How long is it? It's oh, actually man. pretty long. It's yeah. about 20 minutes, but I wouldn't show the whole thing. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. I mean, they actually did a segment. This was mm -hmm. in, in, 79, in 79 where they showed a... a, a, a horizontal axis windmill in Boone, North Carolina, <laughs> and we had just built the windmill. We had a solar and wind lab on the roof of our building in Manhattan, and so Jane Foley yeah. came over and wanted to know how soon we're going to have solar yeah. energy. And that, that would be in, cool. In 79, people, well, Carter was still... Can you run a Mac through your system? No, not not right okay. now. I mean, maybe if we had an, an hour and a half to get it hooked up, but I mean the it, way it, with all the stuff the ways I've got. You don't you don't have a way that you can just plug into the output no. video of no. a computer and go to it. Okay, it's all right. I mean we can watch it on my computer. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we'll do that. Uh, do that in one of the breaks in the afternoon. Okay, you guys maybe. have been through this all, and it's okay. I mean, it, all the things show. Uh, I, yeah, I've, I've scrolled through it. Okay, let, just let's just go through it. Wait, let me know when you're ready. Okay, yeah, we we should start right like right now, but uh, I just want to make slide? sure everything goes. Keep going. Yeah. I want to make sure everything shows. Keep going. Keep going. Can we take our seats, please? Let's get started again. Keep going. Oh, oh well. no, that's not so good. That's a quick time. Yeah. 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 Keep going. Keep going. Okay. I'll just have to skip that. Okay. Let me just I'll do this to get back to the show. Okay. I made it on my Mac, and sometimes the Windows yeah. version doesn't well, I, show everything. I downloaded QuickTime to my PC last week yeah. and uh, because okay. I had several movies that okay. people wanted to show. <coughs> it's doable. Okay, so it's ready. ready to go. Okay, take our seats, please, and let's uh, crank up the last presentation before lunch. Um, we probably have a few, yeah, we probably have a few stragglers outside who are enjoying the good weather. And I want to tell you that our lunch is going to be outside, over in the Jones uh, School. They have a nice, oh, sorry, student center. We're going to walk over the student center, which is about uh, 100 yards away, and there's a nice courtyard there with big oak trees, and you'll get to enjoy the fine weather. So. Now we have to go back to uh, work, and uh, the uh, next speaker directly is Marty Hoffert, who is right here. Thanks. Okay, I too would like to say what a pleasure it is to be here and uh, this august company. Um, I have uh, a lot of things that I'd like to talk about. And just to make sure that I don't forget anything really important, let me begin by saying what my major points are going to be. Um, I came into this business after working back in, 19, in the 1970s at NYU on alternative energy, solar and wind energy. Uh, I, I spent the very big part of my professional career working on the global climate problem, the greenhouse effect from carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. And um, th some, some of these uh, studies wound up in mathematical models that were used by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change to, to make projections about how carbon dioxide would increase in the atmosphere <clears throat> for continued fossil fuel use and how the temperature might change. And, Back in the early days, in the 70s, it was all very theoretical. It was before the Framework Climate Convention uh, in the 90s and before the Kyoto Protocol. And it was just really interesting scientific research, research that I had actually started doing at a place called the Goddard Institute for Space Studies in New York City. Um, however, 
in, in, in the, about the last five or six years, these two interests of mine have been converging. <laughs> and uh, the, the, the issue of whether global climate is changing because of increased carbon dioxide, uh, which you can never prove anything in science, as Karl Popper said, the only thing we can do is, we can never prove anything is true, we can only prove things are false. But this hypothesis has increasingly uh, been verified by a whole slew of, of observations, too numerous to talk about or I would take my whole talk on it. Um, and, and so this has given rise to considerations of um, what is sometimes called mitigation in the field. What can we do about global climate change? Um, and within the, mitigate, the realm of mitigation, C CO2 being the major actor in terms of transforming the Earth's climate, um, the, the, the realization has sort of dawned upon me and many colleagues that renewable energy has got to play a much, much larger role in the energy picture than it's doing right now. As you know, non-hydro renewables are only about 1% of, 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 uh, of the market share. Uh, and so that's what most of this talk is going to be about. Um, but there is a subtext here. Uh, it's not surprising that people who do research are interested in increasing R&D funding. Um, but I think there's something that really goes beyond that because there are kinds, there's an ideological undercurrent here as to whether, whether this R&D should best be done through the mechanisms of the marketplace or what the role of the government is and how big the role of the government is should be relative to the market. And I think that's why this is a great group of people here. And uh, so I'll probably be making some statements about this that might uh, seem controversial, but just bear with me and, and, and maybe we can get to discuss them. Okay, enough preamble. Let's see if the um, view graphs work. Yeah, again, this is not really, um, this talk is not really designed to, to, to prove to you that global warming is true, but there, there are some very remarkable observations here. This is the last, uh, the horizontal axis here, is the last thousand years, and, and there are three um, graphs. Let's see if this works. Yeah, yeah, I'll use the one on the screen. Um, these three graphs basically are showing three things, and the, the lower one is a global population, uh, and there are some things noted down that you guys probably can't read. This is basically the Battle of Hastings and the Norman conquest of the British Isles, and, and this is human population starting around 200 million, and then gradually, as with the magic of exponential growth, uh, gradually increasing, you've got Newton and Galileo in here, and then Watt's steam engine, and the takeoff of the industrial revolution and electrical networks and eventually you have the Wright brothers and Neil Armstrong walking on the moon and uh, the internet and, and, and uh, where is this going to end up? Well, uh, most demographers would say uh, this is certainly not sustainable, six million and counting, but we're in uncharted territory here. Uh, and, and many projections will say, well, we've got to turn over somehow and somewhere human population is going to be leveling off, although it's not clear exactly where that's going to be. Now, at the same time, we've been able to reconstruct how CO2 has varied from a combination of data. Mostly this data comes from ice cores in the Antarctic, but it's been overlaid with the instrumental temperature record over the last 200 years. Uh, and then there's this record at the top from uh, some paleoclimatologists Mann et al. at University of Massachusetts, which has been very controversial in the community of climate skeptics, which there is a whole community of people who don't publish in scientific journals, but who have websites and email distribution lists, and they're very influential with certain people in Congress. And uh, they've been contesting this, but th this is well documented in the scientific literature. Of the last thousand years, as reproduced from paleo climatic proxy records, many different kinds of proxy records, 
basically showing a very slow decline in global temperature for the last 900 years. And then something remarkable happening in the last 100 years where the highest temperatures that we've ever recorded uh, were happening around the end of the 20th century. Again, a trend continuing into the 21st century. And uh, remarkably, this is consistent with uh, projections that many of us have been making about global warming and the green, based on the greenhouse effect from additional carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Um, now, the, the relevance of, of this to, to the energy problem is that if not for global warming, and uh, of course there is also the problem of energy security, which is something else that, as Rick Smalley said, the peak in the, uh, in the liquid hydrocarbon supply, which will most likely be coming in, in the coming decades. But uh, those two factors, but global warming particularly, which has been concerned to me, have, have really changed the agenda for finding a new energy source. Because as we all know, there's plenty of coal. In principle, we know how to make synthetic hydrocarbons from coal. And uh, I think most people in the energy business said, well, we'll use up all the coal and the natural gas in this century, and that's what most of the ec estimates say. But by that time, we will be well into these global coal supplies, and developing countries like China, uh, for example, have, have plenty of coal. And, and developing a new, fundamentally new energy source is going to be a problem for the 22nd century. I mean, it's not quite the Star Trek problem, but it's not my job. Um, what's happened with global warming is that it's really changed the agenda and made it something that, made it something that we should be thinking about much earlier. Uh, I'm going to skip this for now. Uh, and of course, one of the things that we've been talking about is um, the question of whether we can eventually scale up. Um, this very small market share, 1% of renewable energy. And, and I think most of the people in this audience will, will, will agree that wind and, um, and solar, and I'm just showing PV here, but solar thermal is also in this picture, um, are, are, can, the, the question is, can, what can these energy sources do? One, one of our findings from I'm sorry, one, one, uh, okay. one of our major findings from studying the global warming problem is that um, if we wanted to stabilize CO2 in the atmosphere at only twice the pre-industrial level, we would have to, by the year 2050 or even 2054, roughly by mid-century, have the capacity to produce an enormous amount of energy um, without putting CO2 in the atmosphere. Now, that, that's based on an overriding assumption, and that has to do with the, the, the assumption that the global GDP, the gross domestic product of the world, will continue growing at about 3% a year. If some of the earlier predictions of previous decades, like the limits to growth study, which predict that our civilization will collapse somewhere around the year 2020, if that happens, we won't really have that much of a CO2 problem. But if the, the uh, stated objective of, of all the member nations of the United Nations to continue to have growing economies, if, that's, if, if that con trend continues, and if at the same time we say we don't want the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere to become any more than twice what it was in the pre-industrial level, and by the way, twice what it was in the pre-industrial level, would mean that global temperatures would rise as much as they were colder in the last ice age about 18,000 years ago when the average temperature of the Earth was three to five degrees Celsius colder than it is right now. So we would still be faced with a world that might be three to five times warmer than it is right now with that global warming, albeit with a very slight probability despite the film the day after tomorrow that the North Atlantic deep water might reverse and local regions might freeze. Um, so let's get back to the energy, for, to implications of this. This is, we've been talking about these multi-terawatt um, energy sources within the next 50 years and uh, even talking about whether 
they could conceivably come from renewable energy. Again, I'm going to try to go rapidly through this. This is an Exxon plot. So this is energy demand given in millions of barrels a day of oil equivalent, but it could be terawatts or exajoules per year. And, and this panel on the left is a sort of history until about 2004 and out to 2020, its projection. But it, it shows how the total energy use is distributed. All of this darker area here is fossil fuels. This part is industrialized. This part is developing. And, and this gray area is non-fossil fuel. And now you have the first of two scale changes. So note the scale change from 300 million barrels to 60 million barrels. And so this is an expansion of the non-fossil piece. And so this is nuclear, hydro, and biomass collectively. And this thin little wedge here is wind and solar. And now you do another expansion of the scale. So you don't really get to see this picture if you're just looking at the projected installed capacity of photovoltaic cells. But in this projection, you have both wind and, uh, and solar growing exponentially, as everyone is showing here. But because the base is so small, it still becomes a very small fraction in this projection. Admittedly, a projection by Exxon, we can wonder about their self-interest and so forth. But I don't think uh, it, this projection would be too different based on business as usual. Um, we're talking about a very small fraction by even the year 2020. Now, by 2050, uh, the story may be different, but here I'm calling this deja vu uh, because this is kind of a collage of, uh, you know, this is kind of uh, blatant self-promotion here. This is me being interviewed by Jane Pauley back in 1979. We had just built a wind turbine on the roof of our building in lower Manhattan. And 79, Jimmy Carter was president. Everyone thought there was an energy crisis. And actually, the NBC Today show devoted a pretty long segment, it was about 20 minutes long, talking about both our wind turbine and a wind turbine the Department of Energy had built in Boone, North Carolina. And uh, I have this as a quick time movie, maybe I can arrange to show it. But, but anyway, it's been 25 years since then, and uh, I'm sure you all know that the World Trade Center was destroyed on 9-11, but the rebuilding of the World Trade Center is a big deal, particularly to the whole country, but certainly in New York, where I'm from. Uh, and the proposed replacement, the Freedom Tower, designed by Daniel Liebskin, the architect, the uppermost stories, it only has 40 stories of, of office space, but the whole thing is very tall. It's proposed to be 1,776 feet, symbolically. But all of this is an open structure with cables around it, called the cable tension structure. And the idea is to fill this with wind turbines, and which could, in principle, produce something like 10 to 20 percent of the electricity of the building. So this is part of that uh, of ph philosophically idea of green buildings. And what reason it's interesting to me is that our wind turbine back in 79 is really not too far from this proposed World Trade Center wind turbine. But if it gets built, it's going to be the first time in 25 years that there's been a wind turbine in lower Manhattan. Um, and I guess my point for this meeting is we don't really have another 25 years, or we don't have these endless se sequences of 25-year periods to get, rediscover the things that we or actually already know. Um, Politically, the approach to, to wind power, given the absence of uh, any real leadership in Washington, is coming from the states. And the states, is, again, you, as you mostly know, uh, have these things called um, uh, renewable energy portfolios that encourage utilities and others to use renewable energy. And they have various targets. I understand that Arnold is even planning to convert his fleet of Hummers to hydrogen. And uh, I don't know where he's going to get the hydrogen from, but uh, he may actually be one of the few people who can afford to do that. Um, yeah. Now, now, we've seen several of these curves, learning by doing. And, and uh, you know, another one of sort of the leap motif in my talks is this, this um, 
difference of the worldview, the Weltanschauung, if you will, the way economists and politicians tend to look at the problem and the way engineers and scientists do. Don't get me wrong, some of my best friends are economists, but there is a model in economics of how things get done, how technologies are implemented based on the market and based on the idea that private companies use their own R&D funds to develop new technologies where, as that may have been true in the early part of the 20th century of Edison and perhaps Tesla and, 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 and other inventors, including the Wright brothers, since World War II, since um, the massive introduction of government R&D into the military, many of the major technological changes that, that have driven our society economically and I'm talking about a huge number of things from gas turbines and aircraft to uh, space flight leading to satellite telecommunications to um, integrated circuits. And it's true this transistor was developed at Bell Labs, but it was a very different Bell Labs than what we have now in the form of Lucent. But with a very few exceptions, the development of integrated circuits leading to the development of personal computers Remember that Steve Jobs was able to get very inexpensive circuit boards from Hewlett Packard that he and Wozniak put together the first Apple computer with. Um, they didn't develop that from zero. There was a lot of government money behind that. And, and the whole development of, compu of, of computers and the internet itself, the internet which was funded for 30 years, uh, 20 years by DARPA and then another 10 years by the National Science Foundation before it was discovered by Wall Street as the driving factor of economic growth. All of that stuff is government funded. Now I have a lot of slides, but I got to say this because it's coming to be very important in this meeting that uh, one continues to hear that um, you know the government is not should not be playing a big role in in technology development. When, when Newt Gingrich and his friends were, uh, you can tell I'm a New York liberal, which I'm willing to use that horrible L word, uh, were elected to, um, to the Congress, they actually changed the name of a congressional committee. It used to be called the House Committee on Science and Technology. It isn't called that anymore. It's called the House Committee on Science. I know, because I was there. I still have their stationery. And, and they took the technology out because the, the, the federal government shouldn't be developing technology. I mean, that was the ide that's the ideological reason. Now, this is the same government which has basically been the source of all of this technology leading to all of the, the, the economic growth of our country, which has turned out to be leading the world. And uh, so, I mean, I, I can only echo, and I, I've been lucky enough to have met Ken Zweibel recently, and we've exchanged a lot of emails and discussions about this. So what you're going to hear later from me, I have to apologize in advance, Kenneth. I don't emphasize enough the need to fund the generation side and R&D on the generation side of solar PV. But other than that, I stand by some of our findings. Now, what I'm going to be showing next, I've got to actually learn how to go forwards instead of backwards. Um, this, is, this is information that was developed for a, a, a conference that was jointly sponsored by the uh, Pew Climate Foundation and the National Commission for Energy Policy. So I have several collaborators here. Uh, this this uh, part comes from Roger Anderson. And, and one of the things that we felt was important, uh, and there's a report coming out on this too, uh, is that for a large scale up in renewables, and again, with all caveats, please forgive me, Ken. We, I, I very strongly support, let me, maybe I should just say this, I should do all my mea culpas. I very much support improvements in efficiency. The fact that I'm emphasizing technologies of energy supply does not mean that I don't support that. The fact that this talk is going to emphasize some advanced technologies that may seem far out, maybe in a longer time horizon than some people are talking about, it does in no way indicate that I'm not supportive of immediate efforts, the need to do something at a short range. This is a really hard technical problem, and we're going to need everything we can get 
generating enough energy to supply between 100 and 300 percent of all the energy that we use now in the next 50 years without emitting CO2 to the atmosphere is a monumentally difficult problem. We've never faced a technological problem this difficult. And I don't believe we're going to be able to solve it without a, a commitment similar to the Apollo program to get to the moon or the Manhattan Project to develop nuclear weapons. It will take, an, and even if we know how to do it, if we find a series of technologies, the implementation of a transformation of the energy system this great the precedents that I can think of all have to do with World War II, where we started with practically no aircraft, and by the end of the war, we were producing 50,000 planes a year. The, that pr ability to produce industrially on a huge level and transforming our system um, is probably there. It's latent that it has all sorts of political implications for jobs and so forth, but it's, it's kind of sitting there dormantly right now except for the rest of my talk. So one of the things we really need to do is to change this um, electrical grid and to make it more conducive to renewables. And the problem here is matching the load. I mean, this illustration kind of shows that when you have renewables, and this could be wind and solar or some combination of wind and solar, it isn't always matched to the demand cycle. In fact, the fluctuations around the demand cycle may be as much in energy as the actual energy capacity of the system. So you need something else, call it balance of system, but it's really some kind of a system of transmission and storage that will manage the load. And it will be very different if it's going to work from the hub and spoke kind of transmission systems that we have right now. It will probably have to be some kind of an intelligent grid, and uh, it will, and, and it's something that very few people are working on. Now, in one of my discussions with Ken Zweibel, I, I, I believe his position was, well, it's so important, we're being so starved for R&D money to develop basic things like thin films that in a way it's a distraction to think about the transmission and storage problem now because we're not going to need it until later on. However, if we don't think about it now, we're not going to have it for later on. There are very long times that one of the problems in energy is that you sink your investments for very long periods of time. And we have to figure out a way to have a parallel evolutionary process going on while the existing energy system is in, 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 in uh, effect. Now, bear in mind that everything I'm saying is based on the idea that I accept that we need to have a revolutionary change in the global energy system and implement it over the next 50 years. And that is huge. The first nuclear reactor, Fermi's reactor, at the end of 1942 is farther in time from us now than... 2050 is. And all of nuclear power as a fraction of primary energy, not as a fraction of electricity, is less than 5%. Less than 5% of primary energy is nuclear, although 18% or so is electrical. We're talking about 100 to 300%, scaling up almost 20 times as much. Is it even possible to do that is a question I think we should be thinking about seriously, and we should certainly be explaining the need to our elected representatives. Um, the energy storage options, well, this is just a review of things that many of you know uh, for storage. Flywheels, batteries, compressed air turbines, fin and fuel cells, they each have advantages and disadvantages. But none of these systems are as developed or as cost effective as the emphasis has been so far on PV cells. Think about if PV cells were as cheap as toilet paper or if we could make them as paint or something like that. What would the balance of the system look like that would enable a market penetration of 30 or 40 percent of energy share? And I think you would quickly come to this uh, idea of the need for energy and storage. Now, here's a, a scenario that you can think of as either uh, 
optimistic or pessimistic, depending on your, your, your point of view, by some, some other colleagues, uh, Jean Berry and Alan Lamont at Lawrence Livermore. And, and it's a massive carbon-free power, a scenario for carbon-free power by 2050. Uh, and assuming, and this is just for the U.S., and uh, as I hope to get to if I don't get pulled off the podium first, uh, the problem is much worse for the developing world. Well, I shouldn't say worse. That's a value judgment. More challenging. Uh, the U.S. population would be something like 400 million people, up by 40%. Electricity would be up 37 percent. Um, we were assuming a very aggressive scenario with 300,000 five megawatt turbines, which is all the wind power from the Dakotas. Um, solar PV, we'd have 50 million 25 kilowatt roofs. Boy, that's pretty ambitious. Every, I guess these are 25 kil key peak kilowatt roofs. Every rooftop in the United States, oh, of course, uh, I'm sure everyone here knows that a peak kilowatt is five times bigger than the actual kilowatt because roughly, on average, it's only 0 0.2, 200 watts per square meter instead of 1,000 watts per square meter. And um, we're willing to say that we'll have 300 advanced fission reactors, 50% efficient fission reactors producing one gigawatt of electricity each. Now, what would that do? Oh, we're going to have all the cars, 100% hydrogen cars. They're all going to get 80 miles per gallon uh, of cars and trucks, three, and 3 million trucks. And also, we're going to have 5,000 liquid hydrogen airliners. Okay? Now, I think most people in this room would say, this is pretty, this would be pretty great if we could do this. Um, now, I, I, time does not permit me to go into details here, but how would, this, how, how would this work in terms of the inputs and the outputs of the system? Uh, these numbers are in exajoules per year, but they could be in other units as well. So uh, the, in these units, hydro is one, uh, biomass and geothermal are seven, wind is 17, solar is 26, nuclear is 17. There's still coal, but coal is being used to make hydrogen. Um, there's natural gas, which is a big, big fraction, and that's used in various end uses, and there is still oil. And again, this, this complicated, well, it looks like a complicated spaghetti diagram, shows you what happens to the energy as it flows through the, the system finally emerging as end use. And although it is very, very interesting, uh, I don't have time to go into it in detail because there's too much other good stuff coming up. Um, now, that, oh, the one thing, of course, I forgot to say, the one thing about all of this is this would get us in the U.S. back to about our 1995 levels of emissions of 1.4 gigatons of carbon per year. Now, you may know that that is not as low a, uh, a level of carbon emissions as the Kyoto Protocol called for if we had signed it, by, by the year 2008 to 2012, we would have had to have lower emissions than we would get by the year 2050 with this draconian scenario. But bear in mind that GDP, GDP is growing at 3% a year. That's the really tough nut about this, is that GDP is growing and emissions scale with GDP at the same time that you have to reduce emissions. So. Um, even with this massively uh, ambitious program, you're not going to get there. Here, here's the emissions uh, for this business as usual scenario, and this red line is the emissions. Oh, this is a different study than the one I just showed you. This was done by the National Energy Technology Lab of how the U.S. could reduce emissions by 2050. And this is based primarily on sequestration. It's the major thing that the Department of Energy is studying now which is to, to create these power plants that will burn, well, they will have as inputs coal, and it's going to be a massive processing plant. The coal is gasified. Some of it is turned into hydrogen. Some of it is turned into electricity. Since there's a lot of carbon in the coal, the carbon will be collected, separated out from the flue gases, compressed, put into pipelines, and stored underground in cavities beneath the surface uh, probably de depleted aquifers, 
Um, and the first one of those, this, that's DOE's major project to limit CO2 emissions. The first one of those, it's called FutureGen, is projected to be built by the time frame 2010 to 2015. So don't count on it before then, and it may not work. Um, and right now, that's the major thrust of the climate change technology program, along with generation four nuclear reactors. And I guess one of the points we tried to make in this analysis is that we really ought to have some other um, eggs. We shouldn't put all our eggs, some other baskets, let's say. Uh, because it's normal in technology development that certain things don't work. And the best insurance you have, it, it would be to have a robust program where you were developing many technologies in parallel. This is something they do in the Defense Department all the time. I can't tell you how many crazy ideas I myself worked on when I still had security clearance that nobody even knew about that cost incredible billions of dollars. Um, technology evolution, this is an opinion, you don't have to agree with it, but this is my opinion, um, is similar to biological evolution in the sense that it requires mutations. Most mutations are unfavorable. In nature, we get mutations because cosmic rays come and change the DNA of organisms. But in our civilization, these mutations are because people take risks on technology, either with the hope of making a lot of money if they're venture capitalists or if they're governments because it's in the national interest to develop those technologies. And back when it was in the national interest to develop new technologies, back in the 70s when Jimmy Carter, whose ill-fated um, energy policy was last time we had a coherent and systematic attempt to try to develop new energy technologies, actually spawned a lot of very innovative thinkers, including uh, Buckminster Fuller, for example, who proposed this global electrical distribution grid back in the 70s. He composed that, proposed that it would be superconducting, and he did it even before it had been discovered that there could be high temperature superconductors that would be superconducting at the temperature of liquid nitrogen, 77K, instead of four degrees, the temperature of helium. Uh, and a kind of amazingly, uh, uh, scientists discovered that there were such superconductors, and now Rick Smalley um, has made a, a, a remarkable discoveries about the, the, the physical properties of nanotubes, which may include maybe not zero conductivity, uh, I'm sorry, resistivity, but low, but low resistivity, low enough that might make very long distance, maybe even global transmissions feasible. And of course, Peter Glazer in that same time frame proposed solar power satellites, which I spoke briefly about. I have a whole talk on this, but I don't have time to go into too much detail now. The great advantage of solar power satellites is that you get the full solar constant, which is about 1.4 kilowatts per square meter as opposed to 0.2 kilowatts per square meter on, on a long-term average at the surface of the Earth. But even more important, think back to my earlier slide about the uh, mismatch if for base load between renewable energy and demand is that um, solar power satellites, if you put them in geostationary orbit, they, they have the ability to supply base load continuous energy in geostationary orbit. The sun is always shining. Uh, and you have to have the ability, of course, to transmit that energy, which is seven times higher per unit area, to the surface of the Earth wirelessly using either lasers or microwaves. Um, there have been a lot of advances since this idea was originally proposed, um, and but very little serious follow-up. By the way, I mean, if you think about all the people who were thinking about this, including a lot of smart people, including Amory Lovins, who's still around. I was just on a panel with him. He came out of the 70s. Uh, Peter Glazer was, came out of the 70s. Brooklyn, uh, Buckminster Fuller. Um, right now, I mean, I can think of a much smaller number of people. I have to include... Uh, my friend, I hope, Rick Smalley is one of those who is thinking seriously about the big picture. But we don't really have enough colleagues, and you guys are. But, uh, you know, we really need a lot of younger colleagues. Okay, uh, more uh, editorializing later, a little more science. Now, this is one of Rick's 
slides which he encouraged us to steal, and I've been showing it all over the place. But since he showed it, um, I'm going to skip it. Uh, this is what you heard a little bit of uh, Ken's Weibel refer to, this third stream. This is really advice for DOE. Whether they'll take it or not, I don't know. Just think about this. You've got DOE with their $20 billion budget. And what is their charter, their emission-oriented agency? They have two goals. One is toxic waste cleanup. And the other is called stockpile stewardship to make sure that all our nuclear weapons will work as advertised, even though we're not allowed to test them. Now, if you were going to college and studying engineering or science, would you find that an inspiring agency to work for? Um, I think the Department of Energy should actually have the mission to develop new energy sources. There's a revolutionary idea to actually have them working on energy sources that would be transformational. Um, now, of course, there are statements that are made. I mean, the Secretary of Energy, Spencer Abraham, has said that he, he actually read our science paper. He quoted from it extensively in speeches. And, and he said, uh, yeah, we're going to need a revolutionary change in the energy system to be able to, we're not going to sign Kyoto or even participate in the Kyoto process. But we are working on a solution. Uh, and, and we know that this group of scientists thinks we have to change the energy system in a revolutionary way. And we agree with that, and we're doing it. And this is how we're doing it. We're going to build these future-gen coal-fired plants. We have a lot of coal, and we're going to take the carbon and put it underneath the ground, and we're going to make hydrogen, and we're going to have this high-purity hydrogen running hydrogen cars, and we also have a program to develop hydrogen cars with industry, and that's the main thing. And the other thing we're doing is we're developing these Generation 4 nuclear reactors. Now, what is wrong or right about those two technologies would take me very far afield, and I don't want to attack anybody right now. Um, I just want to say, fine, but there should be a third stream. The third stream, in addition to those two, should be renewables. Uh, and I think one of our jobs is to try to decide what that would be in, in the, you know, in the uh, remarkable event that the person who's the next president actually somehow gets this message and says, yeah, this is, this is what America should be doing. This is what America should be leading. Okay, you guys, what should we do? Uh, so now th the problem is made more difficult in some ways. How much time do I have here? Oh, that's too bad. I need at least another half an hour. But the problem is, you just pull me off when I'm done. The problem is made more difficult by the fact that there are well-meaning and good scientists who are basically saying that this is not a technological problem. It's a political problem. If we only didn't have the evil politicians, we know how to solve the problem. The IPCC mitigation panel that's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, said that the, the stables, that these technologies already exist. In fact, they said that we could stabilize CO2 in the atmosphere at any level, 550 parts per million, 450 parts per million, 350 parts per million. It's already higher than 350 parts per million with existing technology. And uh, I think that's absolutely untrue. Uh, and undemonstrated. And I believe that what motivates that, and some more recent studies actually that appeared that I won't have time to explain why they're wrong, incorrect scientifically, not whether it's a matter of value judgments, um, is because there's a feeling that if you say that solving this problem is too complicated, that the politicians won't do anything about it. And I got a lot of emails when our science paper came out from people, particularly in Europe, saying you shouldn't say that we need these new technologies because we have enough trouble convincing our governments to sign on to the Kyoto Protocol. If they think we're going to need new technologies, they won't do anything. Uh, we have to deal with that issue uh, and try to reconcile our integrity as scientists and engineers and our desire to realistically solve the problem with this saying the right thing thing. 
Now, here's this third stream, and again, I think I've apologized about a million times to Ken's Weibel for not having as my number one item here to uh, increasing the level of support for understanding the science base that will result in the cost reductions of uh, photovoltaic and other forms of renewable energy. We took it for granted, I have to admit, that, you know, that things were coming swimmingly along the learning curve, and without any real effort on anyone's part, all of these cost reductions were going to actually happen spontaneously in the marketplace. Certainly should have known better than that. Um, but we did think there were other things that had to be done, systems analysis of massive scale renewable electricity and hydrogen generation, systems integration, uh, physical limits, environmental impacts. We need to really look seriously at low loss grids, computer modeling of high tech hardware. Instead of reading out all of these, let me just say something. There are certain issues that have never been resolved in the renewables community, they just fester. And a major one is the issue of centralized versus decentralized. Um, are we going to have a world where everyone's going to have a fuel cell in their basement and PV cells on their, or, or co industrial complexes or businesses will basically be self-sufficient? Uh, or are we going to have a world where we have remote wind farms, maybe they're in the ocean, maybe they're halfway across the world, feeding through superconducting grids? Um, I like to think about this as somewhat as the Willie Sutton principle. Willie Sutton was a famous bank robber of the 50s, and they asked him, why do you rob banks? And he said, that's where the money is. And uh, that's really true of certain natural energy fluxes, something the biosphere knows, something that organisms know who live in the deep ocean vents where the temperatures are hot enough to boil anything alive, and they manage to live because there's energy there. Um, there's energy in unexpected places if we know how to get it. There's energy in space. I've already talked about that, if we can access it. But there's also energy in the upper atmosphere, the jet stream. We've done some calculations with atmospheric general circulation models that show the energy per unit frontal area is incredibly high in the jet stream. And people have made proposals for tethered autogyros that could collect that energy and bring it down to the surface. Crazy idea. Is it any crazier than ocean thermal energy conversion plants that have pipes sticking into the thermal client of the ocean. Um, I would put it to you that we aren't really studying these things seriously enough. Uh, the argument that they may not work is not an argument if you take the position that failure is not an option. That if we don't solve this energy problem, our civilization is going to collapse. Uh, I know that's not the conventional wisdom in Washington, but um, I think it's true. And I think all of us should think this thing through seriously and uh, whether we may, might want to get a little more involved politically. You know, in, in the United States, we always express our obsessions and uh, subterranean emotions, which is why we do everything anyway, despite what the economists tell us, in the way we spend money and this is the federal R&D budget, and you can see it broken down by sectors. This big fat one, of course, is defense. But um, what you can also see, and this is space, this purple guy, is you can see the space program. Look at this. That's starting from practically zero. You see this big bump. This is all in constant dollars. Uh, so this is the Apollo program. And NASA, too, has been saying, look, you're starving us. We never, you know, why aren't we back here? Um, this is energy. And so here you have this bump, not quite as big as Apollo, but you have the Carter Energy Program. Uh, and then you have Ronald Reagan being elected and his, one of his first acts being to rip the photovoltaic panels off the roof of the White House that Carter had put there. And uh, of course, there still is a reasonable budget here, um, but it's been declining. And of course, this big fat blue wedge is uh, health care, which is going to make us all impoverished. Uh, but you, if you, it's worth thinking about all these things. I don't have enough time to talk ever. But um, 
that, that uh, big, big fat blue wedge is something you think about when you hear the drug companies saying, yep, you have to let us charge a lot of money for drugs because if you don't let us do that, we will not invent anything. And if that's true, why, why are we spending all this money from the federal government? Okay, that, that's an, there are enough controversial things not to fight about everything. Uh, all right, what I think we need to do, and I hope this is open for discussion, is a very broad spectrum Apollo-like program. Uh, and it would normally be targeted at energy rather than carbon reductions, but energy that would be emission-free. I mean, the other model is that, you know, you put a carbon tax on or something, this is the economist model, and the market will spontaneously create the technology. I don't really think that happens. Most companies that have to res respond to their stockholders or venture capitalists have to turn around investments pretty fast, three to five years. And if they're not making money, they're not going to do it. And that's even true of places like Lucent and AT&T. Maybe it wasn't always true, but it's true now. Uh, and so that should be paid for by the government. And we should, maybe it should be initially done by reprogramming the Department of Energy's budget, the same way that NASA's budget has been reprogrammed recently. Uh, the demonstration of smart grids, targeted programs on energy storage. Uh, I think I should be winding down when I'm just getting started. Um, summary and conclusions. So we need to do things at, at several, you need to be able to do more than one thing at the same time. In the near term, uh, I strongly support a, an Apollo or DARPA-like third stream for renewables. When I say DARPA-like, what I mean is that program managers supporting this R&D would have a charter that used to be given to DARPA program managers to develop a new technology, whatever it takes, wherever the talent is. And that's really what they should do. This is totally different than DOE's uh, general approach of incrementalism. There's still some fairly smart people, some very smart people even, in DOE labs, although it's not the rule. And those people are all, all of them that I know are very frustrated by this. Uh, expand the regulatory mechanisms. That's some, something that could be done by uh, p politicians and policymakers. Um, as far as the transmission, avoid simply beefing up the present hub and spoke networks. We have to make sure that the kind of distribution of electrical networks that we have are friendly to a future evolution that will involve a scale-up in renewables. It is very dangerous to say, well, we'll worry about that down the road. I mean, I, of course, by now, I'm old enough to remember when nuclear energy was going to be too cheap to meter, and when they first started building nuclear power plants, and people said, hey, what happens after the plant is over and you have to retire it? Isn't there going to be all this radioactive stuff that we're going to have to put somewhere? And, and the response was, you know, don't worry about it. You know, that's 30 years down the pike. That's not going to be a problem. We'll, we'll figure out something. Well, we are figuring out something. And uh, it is important, the path. The path that you take is something that you need to think about beforehand. We got into the nuclear business by using the light water reactor that was developed uh, by Hyman Rickover for the first nuclear submarine. And that reactor uses water as a moderator and a coolant, but it's susceptible to loss of coolant. And uh, the same is true of the graphite reactor, which can have a criticality accident. So the, the fact that you had TMI and Chernobyl completely changed the evolution of nuclear power. And these are things that could easily happen to carbon sequestration if we build future gen plants. And the best way to deal with this problem is to do what? The military does is to have a whole spectrum of things that you're developing because failure is not an option and, and, that's, and, and because technology evolution is like biological evolution. And, and, uh, and we don't even have a philosophical way of thinking about it that yet that way. In the medium term, we should be targeting a minimum of 10% renewable energies building smart transmission grids. We could do this at national laboratories in, in cooperation with private industry. 
we, of course, want to make renewable energy cost effective, and there have been several talks about that. Uh, we need to really deal seriously with the storage issue. Uh, and in the longer term, and we need to start working on the longer term now, um, we have to be fearless about looking at systems that may seem very far out. Remember, it was 60 years from the Wright brothers to Neil Armstrong stepping on the moon. Uh, when we talk about solar power satellites, for example, uh, we're not talking about something that contains any technology that we don't, in principle, understand. We know how to go into, we'll go into space. We have to cut the cost of, of, of launching objects from the Earth. Or maybe we can even make the materials on the moon. Or maybe we can even build solar collectors on the surface of the moon, as my good friend and colleague Dave Criswell sitting in the back has proposed. Um, there are many, many systems. There are as many different kinds of solar power satellites that one can imagine as there are kinds of airplanes. Uh, some of these would transmit their power versus la via lasers. Uh, some of them would use microwaves. But we have to start seriously studying them. And one of the things we can do, and it's something I'm actually working on with my son Eric, and two of us have started actually an entrepreneurial company to do alternate energy R&D, is to use existing radars and radio astronomy facilities to do experiments in wirelessly beaming power between the Earth and spacecraft to test the efficiency of that particular part of the solar power satellite link. Uh, very hard to get funding. We're trying to get SBIRs, all the stuff you guys know about. Um, but if there were a more receptive R&D environment in Washington, um, I think we would have a much better chance of, of adequately dealing with this very difficult problem. And we, we have to do that at the same time that we're implementing renewable energy portfolios, that we're implementing subsidies for the technologies that we think will allow our civilization to, to sustain itself, to survive. Um, a lot of this has to do with time scale, and I have more stuff, but I also would like to end on a kind of philosophical note, getting back to my friends, the economists. Um, one of the problems when people talk about we have to make all this stuff cost effective, and we have to make you know show that it works in the marketplace, is um, the fact that people very often do things for reasons which are not have nothing to do with economics. They have to do with values. In fact, uh, probably this election will be decided more on the basis of people's values than on the basis of, of economics. It's a nice rationalization. Um, economists would tell you, for example, that if there was an asteroid and it was barreling towards the Earth and it was going to destroy civilization in 50 years, that it wouldn't be cost effective to do very much about it because we could take the money and put it in the bank and by 50 years from now we'll have accrued so much interest that uh, we would have much more money to deflect it with. Uh, but by the way, this is called discounting the future. I'm not making this up. This is, this is really, uh, if there are any economists in the house, they'll, they'll tell you the same thing. Now, now, we would say as scientists, no, no, but if we try to deflect it early, we can just give it a little nudge and you know, we won't have such a big problem when it finally hits us. And um, we need a way to bring those considerations, to bring considerations of externalities like the biosphere that supports and sustains us into these, into these equations. Um, most people do things for reasons that they barely perceive of any way. They rationalize it economically. But I'm almost done. But believe me, big companies spend huge amounts of money on advertising and motivation research to find those secret reasons why we really buy things. Uh, and they are very effective in getting us to do that. So on that happy note, thank you very much. I, I didn't have the heart to cut him off early. I knew there were many, many more good things coming. So I think we got them. So we do have about 20 minutes for discussion. And I suspect there may be a question or two from that talk. An economist first.
Okay. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm an economist, and this is a complete mischaracterization of economics. Uh, what economists do really is tell you their choices. You can either have a speaker talk or you can have discussions, but you can't have both. And I really think to say that economics is making these, uh, you know, dumb statements like this kind of the future is not worth it is complete mischaracterization. And I think if you don't be rational and realize that choices have to be made, we're not going to get anywhere. Sure. Yeah, sit yeah, down okay. and use the mic, Marty. Yeah. What's that? Sit down and use the mic. Yeah. Look, um, as I said, some of my best friends are economists, and, and I think there are valid insights from, from economics. But to say that we have to make choices is one thing. Economists argue that um, people are rational economic actors and make choices depending on the markets that exist. Uh, there are externalities in which there aren't markets to, that, uh, you know, that, and, and many economists understand this. I shouldn't paint with a broad brush. When I was young, in the 60s, I actually studied economics. I went to the New School for Social Research in New York City, and it did, I was also studying engineering at the time, but I studied economics, and all my professors were Marxists. And basically, they, they taught us economics, you know, the way you would study the Bible. That was a theology. A lot of academic economists in those days were Marxists. And then with the, with the breakup of the former Soviet Union, um, market economists are sort of in ascendancy right now. And um, I am not sure that in its predictive mode, I know that we all have to make choices, that economics, that economists have developed ways of guiding our behavior rationally. And uh, forgive me, but I, I would be happy to stand corrected. Uh, you want to respond? Yeah, I mean, to begin with, I don't want to sound crude, but it sounds like maybe he just has broke teachers. <laughs> uh, and second, you know, if you take guys like Ken Arrow yeah. or Bob Solo, yeah. you know, are what we would consider good economists, mm -hmm. they're not quite that simple. I mean, it's, you're sort of, it's more like a cartoon. And maybe it is the fact that you heard from Marxist economists. <laughs> Let's okay. move off I, of Marx and that. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, I'm Nate Lewis. I just want to try to have two questions, hopefully, that will be a little more technical here, although one will be, one won't be. So you spoke about, which I completely agree with, the need to think about, as people who've heard me talk know, distribution and storage at the same time as generation. Because if you don't do that, you don't have anything in the end. If you have the ultimate inexpensive generation system and you have no way of storing it and delivering it to the end user economically, then you don't have an economic energy system. And you have to make them match. Uh, but you spoke about electricity, which is one picture. Superconducting grid is the medium of storage and distribution, batteries or some mechanism like that, and hydrogen, uh, but not about, um, about liquid hydrocarbon fuels. Yeah. And I wonder if, so I'll just ask you the loaded question, is that because you feel there's no good means of injecting them from renewable sources into the system, or that it was just something that we should add as a bullet? I obviously favor doing what plants do and making liquid hydrocarbon fuels as the renewable option and not having to deal with hydrogen at all. Now, on, on the contrary, I think there, there is insufficient work that's been done on uh, renewables as an approach to transportation. I mean, I think we already know that using electric batteries for cars is, is a non-starter. Uh, we have to worry. The big problem here with cars is cars have to be light in order to uh, have good uh, fuel, let's call it energy efficiency, and the onboard storage requirements either of hydrogen or hydrogen is better but it's still not great are very onerous uh, I just don't think we've exercised enough imagination I could imagine cars powered wirelessly from embedded microwave transmitters in the roadbed and then having them charged financially charged as well as electrically charged the way going on a turnpike you would automatically do it and having those uh, powered by some renewable form of energy. Um, but my, to the extent that I have any 
you know, message at all. I would like to say that we haven't unleashed our imaginations enough on this problem. Um, and there might be some other, I mean, certainly the, I'm aware of that technology that you're talking about, about making liquid hydrocarbon fuels from sunlight in real time, and it might be, it might be viable. I, I wouldn't rule out anything. I think the problem is that we don't have a broad enough approach and that we're very fratricidal in the energy business and that anyone who is, you know, trying to promote some other approach is often, not universally, is often viewed as a competitor for the limited funding that we're being starved of. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm not sure that's productive. So now my follow-up question was, you, you spoke about the we mostly in domestic U.S. energy yeah. terms. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I see that there's a maybe equally difficult issue in that you could take the view that no matter what we being the U.S. were to do, even if we were to invent the world's greatest technology, if we don't bring involved in an R&D program as well as an energy efficiency program, China and India, for example, specifically, no matter what we do, if we have all these hydrogen cars and more than 0.8 in every 100 Chinese, which is currently the case, has a vehicle, uh, we're not even going to be treading water with respect to CO2 emissions. We're going to be increasing no matter what happens. How do we bring along um, with us, we're, le we're lagging actually, how do we come up to the level and make this a worldwide effort that everybody realizes has no option to fail? Uh, I, I can address that briefly. I'm not, uh, you know, I don't, I don't have a single silver bullet, but one project that I very much would support would be for NASA to undertake to build a demonstration solar power satellite in equatorial orbit that would be primarily targeted to demonstrating the ability to directly beam energy to uh, tropical developing countries like Kenya, for example, uh, that, that are above the equator. And, you know, there are many countries that are going to completely bypass the wired telephone phase of their development. They're going to go directly to wireless telephones. Um, if we could develop a technology where you could directly beam from Earth orbit to rectennas, which would have a much smaller footprint than terrestrial solar PV, um, I think that could go a long way to building one of these parallel infrastructures. In fact, I have actually published with my former graduate student, Seth Potter, an idea. It was in Technology Review many years ago, uh, the possibility of having satellites that would simultaneously beam power and high bandwidth internet to developing countries um, using the same large antenna elements, uh, which would help to amortize the costs. Um, there are probably a lot of other ideas like that that one could think about if you, if, if you accept the principle of unleashing imaginative ideas. And, um, you know, they, they don't all have to work, but, uh, you know, you only need one transistor to change the world. Yeah. Question down here in the corner first. <clears throat> uh, yeah, I just uh, want to follow the uh, economist remarks because there were several <laughs> straw men that you set up in that talk one of them being economists and the other being uh, the notion that the government doesn't uh, in the, is not to invest in technologies. And uh, last time I looked, Newt Gingrich hadn't been in Congress for quite a number of years. Um, you mentioned the, the uh, climate change technology program, which I would all encourage you to look up on the DOE website. But there's a lot of money going to a lot of different technologies. And, and maybe they're the wrong technologies and maybe not. I'm not sure any of us are in a position to make a judgment, but uh, there's a whole there's a whole menu, a whole spectrum of technologies that we're looking at going out to 2050, starting with renewables, which get about 250 million dollars a year uh, in government spending. Um, and then the other thing, everybody was focused on the United States. One thing that I've personally been involved in with DOE, I'm in the State Department, is putting together a number of international technology coalitions precisely to leverage the limited resources that we have. And that's why we created the Carbon Sequestration uh, Leadership Forum uh, about a year and a half ago, pulling in 14 countries, including India and China. And people tend to forget China's got the second biggest R&D budget in the world. And India has perhaps the world's largest community of scientists and engineers. So they bring something to the table, and they bring it there now. And we've brought them in 
uh, and they're both very enthusiastic on both the carbon sequestration and hydrogen. Um, in fact, India just announced a $500 million hydrogen program of its own. Um, so we have the carbon sequestration, which we're hoping to get breakthroughs in over the next 10 to 15 years. Um, hydrogen, which the President's ambitious goal, which may or may not be realizable of commercializing hydrogen cars by 2025. Uh, you mentioned the Future Gen program, which is tied to the carbon sequestration, which is a billion dollar plant. That's also a public-private partnership, which is another point I want to get to. But um, how do you spend your money and how do you leverage it and how do you connect it with the private sector, which is ultimately going to have to commercialize this stuff, otherwise it's just a, it's just a nice experiment. Um, we also have the Gen 4 nuclear one that you mentioned, and, and the one and uh, the other one, of course, is the International Thermo Experimental uh, Reactor ITER, which is again a multilateral coalition which includes China and may include India. Um, again, so there you have just in those a whole spectrum of technologies, and I didn't mention the National Nanotech Initiative, whose budget has doubled over the last several years and is now in a, uh, I think it's, a, what, f $4 billion over five years. And uh, that has a whole range, as you all know, of energy, techno energy applications. And DOE is trying to integrate that in some of the energy research. So I, I'm not going to defend everything that is going on, but there is quite a bit going on that people don't seem to acknowledge. I think the real challenge is how to make the money we have more effective, which I think will make a case for getting more money and one of the things we've tried to do is, both in the hydrogen initiative and the carbon sequestration, work very closely with the pro with private sector groups, so that there is some symbiosis. And we know that the role of government seems to me to, is to, is, to, is the pre-competitive, riskier technologies, and we need to work to make sure we're trying to invest in, in ones that have a significant chance of payoff. So I'll just throw that on the table. Uh, and um, let's go over here. Uh, just two brief remarks uh, regarding uh, your remark that uh, if, if whatever we come up with as a, a, a genius new technology, if we don't have uh, new states like India and, and, and China on board, it won't help. Um, as a foreigner, I may say this. If you don't take a leading role in the U.S., the others won't follow. You, grossly, you would grossly underestimate your role for the, for the global economy, the global society, uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a model to convert the energy system. So don't worry. The others will sooner or later follow if you take the lead. I have no, no concerns about this. More generally speaking, uh, if, if solar energy is not used in the industrialized world and deployed, or, or if we t would try to use it in, in, in developing countries which might have uh, more sun, but if we don't use it in the industrialized world, it will not be deployed in the, in, in the developing world. We, are, we have to take the lead, even though we might have a little bit more difficult situation, uh, but we have to take the lead, I think. Uh, let's go to the Air Force. Yeah. Hi. Um, my name is Mike Durstock. I work at the Air Force Research Laboratory at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Um, I just kind of want to make a comment on uh, the idea of uh, federal funding, um, following up the comments on from the guy from the D Department of Energy. Um, we've all been focusing on funding coming from the Department of Energy, but I work for the agency that had the, this big chunk of money, uh, research dollars, under the Department of Defense. And I, I just want to point out that there are also efforts, significant efforts, on um, working with Canarca on military shelters, for example, and Dr. Gretzel. Uh, and there are, there are significant efforts of, on, on federal dollars going towards photovoltaic technologies from the Department of Defense and a way to maybe, uh, I agree that a uh, sort of a, an Apollo-like type of uh, uh, mentality is not there. Um, but one way to get that wouldn't sort of take the view of having maybe an intra-agency or inter-agency type of policy where you have Department of Energy and Department of Defense sort of um, making a, a larger type of investment. So I guess the point is that the Department of Defense uh, has a large chunk of federal research dollars, and I don't think we should ignore that when we're going out trying to build larger programs. It shouldn't just be the Department of Energy. It should be a joint effort between the two, two agencies, I think. And Mike, 
what's the Air Force going to do when oil is uh, you know, five or ten times more expensive per gallon than today in uh, flying airplanes? You know, is the DOD going to take the lead for hydrogen-powered aircraft, um, et cetera? I mean, I think the DOD has a major stake in energy, and the question of what's going to happen in 50 years ought to be addressed certainly by the DOD along with the DOE and other agencies too. So uh, right here. Um, just to follow that up, um, actually the, the person who should make this comment is Phil Sharp, but he's not here. He points out that the Apollo model is really the wrong model, um, as is the Manhattan Project the wrong model. Why are they wrong? Well, yeah. there's all that was needed, I mean, all I'm using in a kind of funny way, but all that was needed was a technical fix. You needed to invent something. You needed to invent a weapon. You needed to invent um, a, a, a space platform. Whereas the solutions to the problems that Marty's laid out is a transformation of what are basically la very large-scale commercial systems. And they're really quite different. Now, it may well be that um, the model that much more money in R&D is required, and I would agree with that. Um, but there is a, a vast difference between um, uh, Th these two types of things. And I'm not sure that this model helps us uh, very much because if we can think of a way to get out of the crisis or, th or imagine that it's no longer a crisis or simply a technical crisis, uh, it is both, I would agree. It is both a technical and a politico-commercial crisis at the same time. Hmm. Alex? But, but along that line, the, uh, you know, the Manhattan, the Apollo projects were all driven by threats. And, and the threat that that we do have now is not perceived a by by our politicos principally I think and, and maybe not to to a great extent by the public in general I don't know but uh, but the, the the threat's not there to be able to val uh, to rally the troops and and do a, a large large program and and yes DOE has a program but it's it's peanuts compared to the Apollo program in terms of the equivalent dollars today well, uh, we're talking about four percent of GNP uh, that's a huge program. I, I, if I could just respond real quickly, sure. I, I think it really, this is an interesting question because all these programs, um, even the Internet was created as a response to potential nuclear warfare and the ability for communications after that. Um, is, was 9-11 itself a threat? It, was some, it had some characteristics like Pearl Harbor, but some that were not. And so you, a, a question that I don't think we want to uh, get too far into is, well, why is it that we responded the way we did and would um, a different administration with a different bent, would they have been able to and interested in responding more like in the Apollo approach or, or some other uh, approach that wasn't about um, responding in uh, intervention overseas, but more about a more fundamental R&D sort of response? I, I don't know the answer to that question, but I, I think it sort of begs the question to just say, oh, we, we need to think of this in, in a, uh, as if it was a, an Apollo program for just precisely that reason. We've seen threats at least a small one. Will we need whatever will happen when um, oil uh, conventional petroleum peaks? Is that the, th the threat that will produce the response that we may need? May I make a comment to that? Sure, and this, this will close our comments before lunch. Okay. The, the, the five biggest, uh, the countries with the five biggest oil reserves, if my memory serves, are Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Iran, Kuwait, and Abu Dhabi. Uh, these countries all have something in common, which I think uh, is realized here. Uh, they're countries where Al-Qaeda is active. They're countries with uh, large Islamic populations. Uh, and I don't think we can ignore, uh, I've said enough controversial things, so I want to be careful, the possibility <coughs> that U.S. foreign policy is being influenced by the oil in those countries. Okay, I, I hate to cut it off. I'm sure this discussion will continue over lunch. I wish we could record all the private conversations that are going to happen for the next hour, but uh, we can't. So uh, come back at 1.30. Uh, Amy, Amy has one quick announcement. Okay. We're, we're going to eat lunch outside um, across in, in the garden of the student center, but it sounds easier than, than I'm saying it because it's parents' weekend here at Rice, and we don't want you going to the wrong tent for lunch. <laughs> so uh, there are going to be a couple people from the Baker Institute out in the plaza, and they're going to help us stream to the right lunch group. Uh, uh, and if I see you there with a 20-year-old, I'll know you're in the wrong lunch. So it uh, <laughs> doesn't matter whether they have a better menu or not. 1.30, please, 1.30.